what the secret of life is? No, what? This. Your finger? One thing. Just one thing. That's great, but what's the one thing? That's what you gotta figure out. Curly says the secret to life is just one thing. Just one thing. And if Mitch could just figure out what that one thing is, his life would be perfect. I mean, happiness would describe his life, his marriage would be fixed. He's just got to figure out what that one thing is. Now, truthfully, I think there's a lot of broken people, including us, who are always searching for that one thing. And we search for it in a lot of places that maybe we shouldn't. We, we think it's smart to search there, but really that's not where you're going to find that one thing. But we search for it in relationships. We search for it in our careers. We search for it on social media. We search for it with our sports teams. Sometimes we search for it with just food. Sometimes we search for it at the bottom of a bottle. We even search for it through our kids. And for some reason, that one thing just always seems to be a little bit out of our reach. I've got some good news for you this morning, church. I know what the one thing is. Yeah? I know what the one thing is. I even know where to find the one thing. Do you want to know what it is? Jesus! Okay, four of you. I guess I don't... <laughs> Us and the four of us. We're going to go to the back. We're going to talk about the one thing, okay? Do you want to know what the one thing is? Yes! Right. Paul tells us what it is in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. It says this. I focus on this one thing. Thing. Forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. Paul says, I'm focusing on one thing. Now that phrase, one thing, is, is really important in our Christian life. In fact, it's kind of important even in Christian doctrine. We see it all throughout Scripture. Jesus says to the rich young ruler in Mark chapter 10, there is still one thing that you haven't done. Jesus said to Martha, who was too busy to spend time with him, there is one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it. The man whose blindness had been healed in John chapter 9, he says, one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. And the psalmist writes in Psalm 27 verse 4, one thing I ask for, Lord, the thing I seek most. To live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in His temple. So you see, our problem is we get so involved in many things, focused on so many different things, when God really wants us to focus on just one thing, forgetting the past. Looking forward to what lies ahead. Pressing into Him. Pressing on to receive the prize that God has for those who run the Christian race with great concentration. The one thing that we must always focus on is eternity. Always focus on eternity. When we focus too much on many things, we're divided. And James says in his first chapter of his letter, that those who are divided, their loyalties are divided, that they're, they're like blown around by the wind, they're unsettled. The reason Paul's encouraging us to run the race with such focus is so that we might receive the heavenly prize. The heavenly prize is God calling Paul's name, and your name, and my name, to that victory stand where we will stand face to face, probably on our knees with Jesus and be with Him for eternity. The earthly prizes that we receive here, the blessings we receive from God here, they're great, but the truth is all this earthly stuff doesn't last. It's only the eternal things that last. So in order to get that prize, Paul says, you just keep your focus on that one thing. Keep your eyes locked on eternity. So how do we get there, though? To the point where we are focusing on that one thing. Where we're looking forward, running the race with great devotion. Because the truth is, church, if we can begin to focus on this one thing, God can do many things through us. Christ took hold of Paul. 
And his response to that grace was to do everything he could to, to press on, to spread the gospel message. But how, how do you and I get there? How do we get to this place where our focus is on eternity? Well, the context of our passage actually gives us the how-to when it comes to focusing on this one thing. First, Paul's going to tell us that you must guard your faith. Up to this point in the text, the, we've been talking about matters mostly inside the church. Now he's going to shift to those things outside the church that might try to manipulate the gospel message, that might try to hurt the church, and especially Gentile Christians who are new to the faith. So in Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, he says this, Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. Now, in our context, 2,000 years later, this text seems a little bit strange, right? But we have to remember that back at Pentecost, Acts chapter 1 and 2, you have all of these Jews who are coming to realize, oh my goodness, we killed the Messiah. What should we do to be saved? And, and Peter says, repent, be baptized every one of you for the forgiveness of your sins and receive the Holy Spirit. That's happening. So all the Jews are, are coming to know Christ. And then in Acts chapter 10, it, it shifts and, and you see Peter actually opening the door to the Gentiles and they get to be part of the kingdom. And then a little bit later, Paul, who used to be Saul, he throws the doors wide open to the Gentiles. But what happens is the Jews have a hard time giving up the law. And so they begin, some of them, they're called Judaizers, they begin to tell the Gentiles, hey, you need to convert to Judaism before you can be a Christian. You need to do certain things to kind of earn your salvation a little bit. And one of those things was circumcision. And that begins an argument and and some of the Jews don't like that Paul is allowing Gentiles to become Christians without doing this, without converting. And in Acts 15, you have some men clearly saying, unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Well, in Acts 15 too, it says, Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem, accompanied by some local believers to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. So Paul and Barnabas are, are disagreeing with them, and, and they're saying, no, that, you don't need to do that. And so they end up sending them to Jerusalem. They have this big thing called the Jerusalem Council, where they talk about what do Gentiles need to do in order to be Christians? And James stands up in the midst of that meeting. He quotes a verse from Amos about how Gentiles get to be part of the kingdom too, and then he says in Acts 15, 19, and so my judgment is that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God, which among other things meant circumcision was not necessary for salvation. Now, unfortunately, that didn't stop the Judaizers from following Paul around, disrupting his ministry, causing strife within the church, trying to get these folks to convert to Judaism. And so that's why Paul writes this in Philippians. He says, guys, you need to guard your faith. You need to be careful. Don't listen to what these dogs are saying, which is interesting because the Jews called Gentiles dogs. Paul is flipping the tables. He warns them about these kinds of people so that they will protect their faith. In church, the same thing is happening today. There are people who are trying to manipulate the word there are people who will take the word out of its context and make it say whatever they want to. And some of the most well-known was the health and wealth gospel, but there are many others, false religions and, and cults that start up that do not have the word of God at its core. But the word of God is inspired. It is infallible and it is inerrant. And that's what we believe and that's what Paul believed. And he said, guard your faith to focus on this one thing, to keep your eyes on eternity, you need to guard your faith. How do you do that? How do you guard your faith? Well, there's lots of ways that you can do it, but within the context of our passage, 
Paul actually tells them how to guard their faith, at least one of the ways that you, you can go about guarding your faith. He hints at it in Philippians 3, verse 3, 3 through 8. He gets a little vulnerable here with them. Here, listen to what he says. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could, indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. You see his vulnerability there, right? You see it. Paul is saying, hey, I'm I'm a Pharisee among Pharisees. He persecuted the church, but he says that status meant nothing now. He considers it worthless, rubbish. It was trash compared to what Christ had done, compared to the value of knowing Jesus. So one of the ways that you guard your faith is to know Christ, to value the relationship that you get to have with the Father, with the Son, and with the Spirit. The Christian life, guys, is not a list of rules to be followed. It is a relationship to build. And that is the wonderful thing about serving and loving in Christ and being part of the kingdom. That's what Paul wants them to continue to, to rest in. And so in, in the rest of the passage, Philippians 3, 8, he says, For his sake I have discarded everything else, can, can, uh, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection of the dead. That's what it looks like to guard your faith. Do you know Christ? Have you experienced his power? Are you willing to suffer for him and with him? We got to stop putting our confidence in things that have no value and instead focus on that one thing, keeping your eyes locked on eternity with Christ. Because the thing we ought to value most in this life truly is our relationship with God. Listen to the words of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah 9, 22, it says this. This is what the Lord says. Don't let the wise boast in their wisdom or the powerful boast in their power or the rich boast in their riches, but those who wish to boast should boast in this alone that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love and who brings justice and righteousness to the earth and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. (laughs) Guys, it doesn't get any clearer than that. Our God is telling us that the one thing we can boast in is our relationship with him. You want to focus on that one thing? Focus on eternity? Then guard your faith by knowing Christ, knowing him. The next thing that can help us keep our focus on eternal things is to never be satisfied with where you are spiritually. Now, listen, I'm not saying that you, you should beat yourself up every time you slip up and make a mistake, and I'm not saying that you should have this pessimistic attitude about your spiritual life. What I'm saying is that we just always need to be moving forward, always making headway in, in our growth as followers of Christ. Uh, in 1999, my dad and I had uh, just the, the trip of a lifetime, to a place called Philmont Scout Ranch. Uh, so you may have heard of that, down in New Mexico. And uh, we hiked 90 miles over 11 days. And my dad lost 50 or 60 pounds just to get in good enough shape to go. But to get up to the top of the highest point on the ranch, uh, which is Baldy Mountain, there, it's kind of an old mining area. And so you take one step and you slide half a step. One step, slide half a step. 
So it was pretty hard to get all the way up there. So we just set goals. I said, okay, dad, I want you to take 25 steps. We'll rest for a minute. And then I want you to take 20 steps, then rest for a minute, then 15, rest for a minute. Because we, we determined that we were going to make it up there. We were not going to be satisfied unless we all made it up to the top together. And the same has to be true in your spiritual life. Paul was never satisfied with where he was spiritually. Philippians 3.12 says, I do not mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection. He says, I'm not perfect. No, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. Paul was satisfied with Christ, but he was not satisfied with his walk with Christ. Can I tell you what we sometimes do? That, this happens, sometimes we know it, sometimes we don't. We compare ourselves with each other. And sometimes we compare ourselves to make first ourselves feel better. Well, I'm more spiritual than they are. Or sometimes it's the opposite. We compare ourselves with somebody else and we make ourselves feel guilty. Like somehow that's going to help us grow. And really, we don't want to lean in either one of those directions. We have to be careful in our evaluation of self not to go too far. Yes, we we need to evaluate self, but we have to do it in a way that that is true, that is honest. And you, you don't need to compare yourself with other people. Your walk with Christ is your walk. Continue down that path. Continue to move forward in that way. The Bible actually warns us about spiritual evaluation in a way that is not true. Uh, We see it especially in Revelation. When John is writing to the churches, uh, those seven churches, a couple of them, he talks about how they were satisfied with where they were. So the church in Sardis, they had this reputation for being alive. And Jesus says, you're not alive, you're actually dead. The church in Laodicea, they had really given all of their, their trust to stuff to what they had. And Jesus says in Revelation 3, 17, you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Whoa. See, Paul had no illusions about himself. He knew, I need to keep pressing forward. He was not satisfied with where he was spiritually. I read a quote while preparing this message this week that said, grow up and recognize you aren't grown all the way yet. (laughs) It's just this idea that, We always keep growing. We need to be content with Christ, yes. Because if we don't have that first, you're never gonna be able to focus on that one thing. You'll never be able to focus on eternity if you're not content with Christ. But you can't become content with your spiritual life. Allow the Holy Spirit to work in you, to help you grow, to help you flourish for the kingdom. Take those steps of faith. Doing that is going to help you focus on that one thing, and it will allow God to do many things through us. Finally, Paul encourages us to be determined and disciplined in your focus. Paul says, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize. The Greek word for for I press on, that phrase is dioko, and it means to pursue, to chase, or to hunt. That's the kind of determination that we need to have in this race. That's the kind of determination uh, that boldly pursues the loss, that, that wins people to Christ. What if we decided to put as much determination into our spiritual life as we do into our hobbies, or as we do into our homes, or as we do into our excitement about our sports teams. See, there are two extremes to avoid here when it comes to determination. There is some who have this thought that I have to always be earning my salvation. It's this works-oriented salvation. And then there's this other group that says, well, God has already done the work of salvation, which he has, but since he's done it all, I don't need to do anything. I mean, what do I need? I'm saved, so why do I need to continue to grow? And, and that's not the way we should go about that. Both of those types of thinking don't give us a clear picture of what it really looks like to run the Christian race with determination. God wants to work through us, but our focus has to be on eternity in order for him to do that. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 helps us understand this. It says, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. 
For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So God does all the work of salvation. Even your baptism is a work that he does. And although he does all the work of salvation, you and I were made for good works. We were made to work for God. We we are his handiwork, he says. So don't get so busy dying to self that you forget to be raised back to life and and work for him and do these good works. And don't be so sure that that you can make it on your own as well and, and not include the word, not include prayer, not asking the Holy Spirit to move in your life. We have to have the determination to run the race that God has marked out for each one of us. God made all of you, every single one of you, for a specific purpose. And he knows what that is. And you have to find that and run your race. No matter how successful we may be in the eyes of the world, we cannot receive the prize that God has for us without the determination to focus on that one thing. Few of you may recognize the name Derek Redmond. Now, if you don't recognize the name, if we have the picture, you might recognize the picture. Derek Redmond was a British sprinter, and in 1992 at the Olympics, he was running in the semifinal race 400 meters, and he tore his hamstring. And he immediately dropped to the ground in pain. Quickly, he popped back up. And he started to kind of hobble along. And he actually made the last turn, but then the adrenaline that he had was overtaken by the pain that he felt, and he fell down to the ground again. About the time he fell down, his father came running out of the stands, jumped over the fence, pushed aside the security because he knew what his son had in mind. He knew that Derek was determined to finish that race. And so he leaned on his father, for the last hundred yards, and they finished that race together. Guys, we have to be determined to finish our race well. Sometimes you're gonna have to limp to the finish line, and sometimes you just need to lean into the Father and allow him to carry you there, but we need to be determined to finish well, and along with that determination also comes discipline. That's why Paul writes Philippians 3, 15 and 16. He says, let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. And if you uh, disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Well, the only way to hold on to progress, really in any area of life, is through discipline. It's, It's the only way you can do it. So whether that's disciplining ourselves or receiving discipline from another brother or sister in Christ. Paul wants us to have the discipline to remain steadfast in our beliefs and in our convictions. That phrase, hold on, is the Greek word stokio, and it means to position, to, to be at a position in, in a proper way, but it, I, the, the definition I love more is to be in proper battle formation with other soldiers. That's what it means to hold on. You're in proper battle formation with other soldiers. So Paul is still pointing back to that idea of unity, that we must remain disciplined, not only in our beliefs, but also in the unity we have within the body of Christ. We must help each other remain focused on that one thing, that we forget whatever sins, whatever held us back in the past, but we look forward to what lies ahead, pressing on to gain that prize, eternal life. So where is your focus today? Are you focused on that one thing? Are you focused on eternity? If we can learn to focus on that one thing, God can do many things through us. 2 Corinthians 4.18 says, So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary. But what is unseen is eternal. If I'm being honest, there are times in my life when, yeah, I've been really focused on eternity. And there's times in my life where I haven't been. And I remember the times when I was very much focused on eternity is 2012. My father had just passed away. So his passing kind of caused me to focus a little bit more on eternity. In 2012 in Oklahoma, where Abby and I were living at the time, there were these small earthquakes happening, and which is strange. You know, Oklahoma's a weird place. But (laughs) 
earthquakes started to happen. We already had tornadoes and they're like, hail, now we got earthquakes. So, but I remember standing in my bedroom and an earthquake started and I could feel it shaking. And my, I was so focused on eternity, I thought Jesus was coming back. I'm not kidding you. I like that excitement you get. I mean, it was overwhelming. I thought, he's coming. It's right now. It's happening right now. This is me. And, and so I ran out in the living room. My wife is there. My, my in-laws are there. And I'm like, he's coming back. We're about to see Jesus. The trumpets are going to sound. And they're like, calm down. It's an earthquake. <laughs> but I was, I was so focused at that time in my life that, and I thought, this is it. And then there's been the other times when I wasn't focused on eternity. And I missed an opportunity or two or three to make an impact for the kingdom. Paul says, I want you to focus on one thing. Just one thing. He forgot his troubled past when he persecuted the church. And instead, he just looked forward to what lies ahead. And he pressed on to the end of the race to receive the prize. The prize is eternity. Is that where your focus is today? Is that where my focus is today? Because it can be. It can be. But you need to guard your faith. Don't get satisfied with where you are spiritually and be determined and disciplined in your focus. You may have heard the saying that you don't want to be so heavenly minded that you make no earthly difference. I understand where that thought comes from. I'm just not sure that scripture would agree with it. See, just because your focus is on eternity doesn't mean you can't make a huge difference here on this earth. Our passage seems to indicate the opposite of that. If we keep our focus on this one thing, God can do many things through us. Perhaps it's the writer of Hebrews that says it best when he wrote in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Don't grow weary, church. God's in control. God's got this. We just need to keep our focus on that one thing, eternity. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus who sits at the right hand of God in eternity. And if we do that, guys, there's no end to what he could do through us. So I don't know where everybody's at today in their walk. Maybe you've gotten to a place where you're a little bit satisfied. And you needed to hear this today. You needed to hear from Paul, hey, no, you, you keep pressing forward. Maybe some of you are here today and you've been hanging on to that stuff in the past. You've been hanging on to those, those habits. You've been hanging on to those things that have, that have kind of pulled you down, those sins. And it's time for you to just let go and press forward. Focus on eternity. I know that our past can sometimes dictate our future. I understand that. But sometimes we just need to leave the past behind. If it's holding you back, you leave it behind. Move forward. As you do, guard your faith. Guard your families. Speaking to you men in here, if you have families, it's your job. Guard your family. Protect them spiritually. Just like you go around and check all the doors at night, make sure they're locked. Do that in the spiritual realm too. Wherever you're at today, I just want to encourage you and encourage myself. Focus on that one thing. Keep your eyes on eternity. I'm going to pray to close. If you need to receive prayer for anything, I'd ask that our prayer partners come up after I'm done praying.
So let's go to the Lord. Father, I thank you for your word. Love how your word speaks to our heart, how whether it's Paul or Peter or or maybe it was Apollos with Hebrews. You inspired those men. You made your word infallible. You made your word inerrant and and it speaks to us. And today you, you have spoken to us to get our focus right. So help us to do that. I know we have a holiday coming up and I'm so thankful that I live in this country and it is such a blessing to have have the independence that we have here. And we have been able to send so many people across the world with all the blessings that we've received here as the church and, and we're thankful for that. But we know that in the end, our focus has to be on eternity. And so help us, even as we head into that holiday, that... We thank you for what you've given us, but we keep our eyes set on eternity. So help us to do that. Help us to run our race as we should. Each one of us, help us to find our purpose and leave behind the baggage of the past, the sins, the struggles, and to just move forward in you, through you, for you. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you do for us. Thank you most of all for your son that changed everything for us that gives us an eternity to focus on. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Love you guys. Have a great week.